there is a lot of people out there listening to the podcast right now that are going through the same thing and they're like, if I can work harder and prove that I'm capable or quote unquote prove my work, the company will see my work. And it's like, they're not. The company doesn't care about your loyalty. <laughs> the company cares about the bottom line and you have to be selfish and go find the things that bring you purpose. There's a gap on the narrative that I want to hear that people like me need to hear, right? Because that the author that wrote the book didn't experience financial trauma, didn't experience um, being underpaid, didn't experience like ha being raised by a single mom. But I was like, okay, enough about me. What can I learn from these people? So I've learned a couple of things there. <laughs> exactly right. What you're saying, if you want to heal your inner niña or any wounds, launch a business. And it's worth it. In that moment, it feels like the world is against you. In that moment, it feels like failure is choking you it feels like you're never gonna see the light but that moment you get that client that says yes to you and here's my money and help me and then you turn around and give them results that changes everything for you hello everyone this is bam the Gava Pam, the bilingual podcast that features Latine and people of the global majority who break barriers, change lives, and make the world a better place. Welcome to episode 378 of Cafe Compa. Today, we have a conversation with Lucy King. Lucy is a Latina certified trauma-informed financial and business coach, author, community leader, and founder of Say Hola Wealth. In 2019, Lucy launched her coaching business after she was denied access to financial advice because she didn't have $100,000 to start investing and witnessing how many Latinas and people of color were losing their jobs due to a global pandemic. And also, they didn't have a $500 emergency fund. Now, she teaches Latinas and women of color the strategies she used to pay off $220,000 in student loan debt in 36 months and be on track to make work optional at 45. In 2021, Creative Human Official recognized her as a Power of Women honoree for her resilience and dedication to improving her career by opening her business despite a global pandemic. In May 2022, Lucy became a contributor author of Today's Inspired Latina Volume X, or volume 10, where she shares her personal story of success despite adversity. Lucy King is the founder of Say Hola Wealth, a financial and business coaching agency for first-generation Latinas and immigrants. Listeners, this conversation we had with Lucy was really cool. It was a lot of fun. We got to talk about, of course, her story and so many things, obviously money, and I think you're going to leave inspired at least to start saving. And frankly, I hope you consider exploring, tuning into the curiosity that Lucy talks about and explore your own money story. Because I think we all have and show up in the world with our own money stories and and tuning into being curious about what are they is something that can definitely help you get to know yourself better. Let's start there. And then we can go into inner niña work, inner child work. But for now, at least be curious, I think. That's, I think, one of the things that you can take from this interview. Pero bueno, te dejo que tú le escuches and you make your own conclusions, decisions. Sin más, here's my conversation with Lucy King. Lucy, welcome to Café con Pam. Hola, Pam. Thank you so much for having me. It's It's been way overdue. <laughs> it's been way overdue. <laughs> Before we start recording, I'm like, why did this take so long? But it's one of those things that, like you said, it happens when it's supposed to happen. So here we are. So the first question that we ask is, what is your heritage? So my family is from Mexico, uh, specifically in Guanajuato. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in rural Oregon where it's kind of interesting because the town was very much 50% or, or more 
uh, Latino and the other, I want to say half or a little bit less half was Caucasian. But I, you know, me and my family coming from a town where diversity was part of like the everyday life, it was a little bit shocking when we finally established in this town. And I was like, where are older people? Like, where are other ethnicities? Where is the people of color? Like, what is happening? And it took a long time for people to actually start coming to the town and eventually, you know, getting diverse. And even today, um, I no longer live there, but I, I do go back and visit there. And I see like the changes of like how there's a slowly catching up. getting there. Yeah. ¿Y por qué there? You know, that's a great question. So my mom had a sister who just decided to move there. And you know, como somos like, if, if the tía moves, you're like, it's, sí, claro. it's, it's, it's blooming, come over here. And so. Es bien tranquilo. <laughs> yeah, it's so quiet. There's there's like peaceful. And I was like, I I was used to, you know, living in the city. I was used to just taking the bus to go places. And now I needed a car and all of these things. And so really it was my tia that made it happen. And I always wonder like, why don't we live in a bigger city, right? Now I live in a big city, but in that moment, I was just like, it was a cultural shock for me to see like even the way things were done in the high school, at the high school level, right? Where I was used to like, me ponían un uniforme to go to claro. school and things like that. Te quedó chico el pueblo, ¿no? Yeah, you, you, have to wear, <laughs> you have to wear your own clothes. And that was the first time, actually, now that you're saying that, you're reminding me, the first time I saw people wearing white tennis shoes. And I was like, why do they wear white tennis shoes? Because to me, that was like, a sign of like you're part of a gang, right? Because that's how that's how we grew up. You know, I'm not saying that that is this, this stereotypical thing right now, but that's how I grew up. So I remember just watching everyone like, why, why tennis shoes? And I showed up to the high school with my tacones, my mini claro. niña popis, you know. And I was just like, huh, interesting. <laughs> so that's why my tia is the the responsible one for us moving there. But it's fascinating. Como te quedó. Chico el Pueblo, and how old were you? You were in high school. Yes. So your education had been formed in Mexico. Yo fui a la escuela en Mexico, and school is very different. So I understand. I concur 100% the not using uniform when all my life I had been wearing uniform. And this is public and private schools. You wore uniform. Yes. And so I don't know if that was hard for you, but I was like, I – what? Like, I don't know what to wear. This is really confusing. Was that for you? Well, absolutely. And I, I even remember, uh, you know, like, las envidiosas are you saying it? Like, uh -huh. people were like, don't wear that to school because that's what you wear when you go when you go to a party. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I, I dress like this. And oh, this was in high school, but my family had moved back and forth, like, for years. And so, but I really like that. The, the way I dressed when I was in Mexico because I, I don't know, I just like having that energy of like, you know, so una niña popis. And I remember going to buy clothes and I couldn't find clothes that I liked because they were so different. And when we went back to Mexico, I would always have like, okay, I'm going to buy my clothes for this next uh, school year. So eventually I will have like, you know, like the nice clothes. Uh, I remember, I don't know if I can mention brands on your show, but like I remember buying like Zapatos Andrea, because they were like so popular. Claro, del catálogo. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. You know what's funny? When I went to college, I worked full-time and went to school full-time. Y bueno, trabajé en una oficina, ¿no? Entonces, something that happened to me all the time was people thought I worked at the college. Like, I, they thought I was an employee because the way I dressed. And so, this is fascinating The the... And this is, you know, I hope nobody gets offended about this, but like the fodongues que sucede in the U.S., like there's a much more laid back way of dressing. Yep. I'm from the Mexico City. But in the, in, in the cities, in Latino America, I think it's in general, because if you go to Miami, like everyone's dressed up to the T. And I think it's because they come from bigger cities in, in, in Latino America. And so I think it's that thing of like you get dressed And, you know, there's so many memes and so many videos about it where it's like, mi mamá nunca sale de su casa without, like, lipstick or 
that's kind of like how we are raised. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I will say like I am, I am a little bit more fodonga now for certain things Same. for certain days. Same. But I always <laughs> like to dress up. Even like I work from home. Like this is my casita, and so. I knew I was coming to your podcast. I'm like, okay, I'm aware. Like, you know, like I'm going to dress up. Like I'm wearing high heels. Nobody's going to notice that on the podcast, but I'm like, I have to show up for that energy of like always being prepared. And I do love dressing up and I, I don't like buying clothes, but I do like dressing up. Like I am okay spending the money on things, but I, I just don't like wasting time trying to go through clothes and see what looks good. Like I just want someone to tell me what to wear and I'll wear it. <laughs> I know. Sí, la fodonga es algo muy interesante. And 100%, I think, to your point, yo también, o sea, ya me hice muy fodonga. O sea, there's no way. I think about it and I'm like, there's no way, like, past me would look at me now and be like, qué pena me das. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, o sea, quítate para allá. I don't want to be seen with sí. you. <laughs> Peinate, por lo menos. Lucy, so you grew up in, in Oregon, and then what happens? Yeah, so I grew up there. So I, I went to high school there. I went to college there while I was... So I went to a community college, which I'm very proud to say that because a lot of people are like, I que pena, like community college, like don't mention it, right? But I took a lot of pride in going to a local community college because A, I was able to get scholarships to go there mm -hmm. because like honestly like I, I after I was done with high school like I thought okay I'm gonna find a job me voy a comprar la troca I'm gonna have a house right I wasn't thinking about marriage at that time but that was my identity and I was able to have a full-time job and still go to college so like for me that was like my success like my American dream and I was able to finish that that my college had a community college. And then the company that I was working at that time was opening new positions. And so I was eventually able to climb the corporate ladder. But my whole college career, like I was working full time job and even in high school. And, you know, I because of my desire to see education as a way for upward mobility, because we were very poor, we were poverty, poverty, poverty. I was able to eventually get a job as a manager where I was getting paid more money. And for me, it was really important to help my family financially mm -hmm. and also help myself financially, right? Because I was like, I have some goals. Like, I got to get the car. I got to get all these things that you think you need when you're young. <laughs> and after I was done with that community college, I transitioned to another community college where I, where I was able to obtain my bachelor's degree. And I was part of a pilot program where this was like the first time of this community college launching a bachelor's program at a community college. Wow. We the community college cost, which I was like, sign me up, like savings, right? Continue to work for the company. And my first job with that company was as a housekeeper. So I, I signed up for that job. You know, La Niña Pop is now as a housekeeper. And I was cleaning toilets. Then I was like front desk, so worked my way up all the way until I became the general manager of this company. And, you know, when I was at the top, I struggled so much with support, mm. with the mentorship, with the leadership skills that they think, you know, because you are you got the job. But reality is like you don't know because your whole life you have been on survival mode. And so I eventually... Latina, Latina Equal Pay Day is happening soon as we're recording the podcast. So Which is wild. It's at the end of the year. Yeah. So eventually I realized I was very underpaid for, for my skill set. Mm. Um, I had access to the company salary bands where I could physically see that I was underpaid 45K compared to other white men. Oh my gosh. When I raised concerns about these, I was told, well, you're young. You don't have the experience. Like, There was always a reason why I wasn't getting paid what I wanted to get paid and what other people were getting paid for the same job. And so I I went through a lot of toxicity in the workplace because I spoke up. I went through a lot of life-changing events where like eventually I, it wasn't a healthy work environment for me. Yeah. And so I left. And can you imagine like leaving a job that you've done for 17 years where your whole identity is your job 
And I felt like the world was going to end. I, I cried for days. I was like, I don't know who I was. You know, que voy a say? Like, financially, I was able to depend on my husband. But you were married already. I, I was married at that time. But, and I, but I felt so guilty because I worked for, like, I worked since I was 14 years old. And so not having to depend on somebody else's income was like, oh, my God, what's going to happen to me, right? Bueno, pero a ver, espérame. Tú pregúntame. How was your identity shaken up going from Niña Popis that you mentioned to being a housekeeper? Yeah. Was there like something that was tugged there? You know, honestly, like I said, I'll do whatever. Like I'll, I'll do whatever it takes because I knew that I wanted to go to school because m my whole life, because my family moved so much because of financial constraints. We never had savings. We never had, we never owned a home. Mm. And by the time I was 18, my, we have moved 28 times. Wow. So I knew that I didn't want that for my future. And in that moment, I'm not like thinking about family or kids. It's just like, I just want to belong. Because I grew up with that sense of like, I don't belong anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm in Mexico, me preguntan de donde soy. When I'm here, they ask me like where I'm from. And I always grew up like that, but also because we moved so much, you can only imagine how when you make new friends, they're like, okay, well, where do you live before? And you're like, well, I used to live there, but also before that I live here. So there was always the identity of like, I don't belong. And so to answer your question, when I got the, the job as a housekeeper, first of all, working for a hotel was like my childhood dream. Like I wanted to be that manager that walk with the suit that say hello to everyone in the breakfast area because I I, I live that um, particularly when my mom took my grandma to Mexico City to get her her passport so she could come here and I said that and I was like I want this like I want this life like I want to work awesome. for a hotel and so when I walked to the hotel in rural Oregon I was like I'm gonna go in asked for that dream childhood job and they're like you can be a housekeeper and I was like oh okay so I will I will do it little did I know that cleaning 25 rooms per day was a lot of physical work yeah I remember my first day coming home and even me pelo was all crazy like 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 I just got into a fight my mom is like how'd it go And I was like, I can't feel my legs. Like, I just need to go to bed. And I remember crashing for the night. Like, I didn't even have dinner. Like, I was like, I'm exhausted. The next day, I woke up and everything was sort of hasta mi pelo. I was like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this, right? And I was like, wow. Like, and I was very skinny back then, right? But I was like, am I like, am I not fit for this job? Like, what's going on? And I just kept going. But one of the things that I've noticed about the job, you know, obviously nobody, nobody enjoys scrubbing toilets. Like, I don't care who you are, nobody loves that. But one of the things I noticed about the particular job is that there was so much time in between from the moment I entered the room to the moment I left the room. Mm. So what I started doing is I became very mindful of how can I maximize the time that I have, not just to clean the room and do a good job, but also how can I use that time to learn something? So I got hooked on audiobooks. Okay. It was permitted to use like an earpiece or things like that. And so I would put an earpiece and clean the room. And I remember listening to books about how to become better and the habits that you needed to adopt to move ahead. Even my lessons for my for my college, like I would listen to the class on audio because I was like, I got no time to lose. Like I have to be, first of all, I have to have good grades, right? Because I'm, right. I was given scholarships. But I love being a housekeeper for that reason, that that version of me and her commitment make me be here with you today. Totally. Totally. I love that because it literally is like you got paid to learn. Absolutely. And I, I love that perspective because it's it really is about the angle that you look at things, you know, from. So you start with this job. And I love that your inner niña was like, we're going to be a manager. And then she dragged you through every role. But she did it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you get to that point in your life when you're like, I can't do this anymore. This is toxic. It's too much, et cetera, et cetera. How long does it take from you to 
to be like, this is a lot to, I put my notice. Yeah. So it took me eight years. Oh, shit. Eight years. Because, you know, as you mentioned, I work my butt off for the Ina Nina, right? Like that was my dream. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but like my experience and some of the people that I serve is like, we grab onto that dream. Like there's no other dream. And even if we're suffering or even if it's toxic, we're like, no, like I work my butt off for this and I'm going to get cost fallacy. Hasta que me, me caiga or like even till I die. So that was truly how I feel. It's like I work my butt off. Like I remember working late. I remember waking up early. I remember the audiobooks. I remember no going to prom because I needed to study for Tesla. So I hold on to the dream of like, I can't this, I just can't let go. And eventually I've noticed that my mental health was taking a toll. And I think for me, that was like the biggest wake up call where I became a mom. I married my husband and my, hu- my husband will help me as much as he could. And eventually he said, Lucy, he's like, you're not present with our newborn baby. Like, yes, you're feeding her. But as you're feeding her, because I was breastfeeding, he's like, you're like responding to emails. Like I literally have my baby like this and I'm texting like emails and he's like that he's like that needs to stop yeah and I was like how dare you like I work for like I work my butt off to be here and he's like okay he's like I'm not I'm he's like I'm 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 never gonna tell you what to do with your job you I want you to figure it out and so I've learned that that my job didn't stop at 5 p.m my Mm. job was coming home with me my job was calling me at 2 a.m. with the wake up calls because someone couldn't figure things out, even though they had been properly trained on things. And I realized that I was skipping my breakfast. Mm. I was skipping my lunch because I was so busy, right? Like the mindset of productivity and can't let shit happen because I have to I have to produce, produce, produce. And eventually, yeah, my mental health was like, I, I can't do this to myself anymore. And it took couple of weeks for me to type the letter and finally say enough and even though there were several times when I look at the salary bands and I could see that I was underpaid even though there were times where my salary got tied my my bonuses excuse me got taken away I still was like but if I can just prove that I'm capable right wow eventually I was like I gotta go so it took me eight years and there is a lot of people out there listening to the podcast right now that are going through the same thing. And they're like, if I can work harder and prove that I'm capable or quote unquote, prove my work, the company will see my work. And it's like, they're not, the company doesn't care about your loyalty. <laughs> the uh-huh. company cares about the bottom line and you have to be selfish and go find the things that bring you purpose. So I left. Did you have an exit plan? So those eight years you were miserable. And did you like have savings or were you just like, you know what? I, I, I done, I done. I was done. I had $2,000 in a regular checking account because nobody, nobody in my house, in my family knew about budgeting. Nobody in my family knew about investing. I had a 401k, thankfully that I was participating in at the minimum I work, but I had no savings. And the irony of this whole story is also that I was in charge of managing the company's budget. I was in charge of helping them make 2.5 million a year for one property. So I knew their numbers. Like you can ask me, how much do you spend on empl- uh, on labor costs, supplies, trips, events? Like I could give you up to the penny. But when it came to my personal finances, I was completely a money avoidant. I was like, you know, solo se vive una vez mentality. Like there's always more. Me lo merezco. I'll get to it when I have time. Like all of this is scarcity mindset that you think is normal because that's what we grew up seeing, right? Nobody knows this unless you have a papa that is like very rich, like siéntate and do the budget. If you don't get good grades, you're not going to get money, right? Like that control of the, of the money. I didn't have that because I was raised by a single mom who was always in survival mode. So no, no exit plan other than my body was telling me it's time for you to go. Totally. Let's take a coffee break. 
Does he do drink coffee? I do. I have it right there. <laughs> but I'm nice. going to drink water right now. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, how do you drink your coffee? I like my coffee black. And if I have sugar at home, like raw, it has to be raw sugar. Okay. Yeah. So normally it's black coffee. Yes. And I only drink uh, eight ounces. <laughs> I guess in my previous life, I was always drinking like five cups a day, six cups a day. And now I'm like, no, like I, I need to enjoy it. And I'm very mindful of when I drink it. Um, like I intentionally, for example, remove myself from my office and I will go and sit down. Como like, you know, like, I think like that puppy's girl will probably do like, <laughs> I sit on the couch, go me platito, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to drink it. Be mindful, right? Very mindful. Um, but I do like coffee. I love coffee. Nice. And so what's your method of pouring your coffee? What's your brewing method? My brewing method is whatever is going to save me the most time. So <laughs> I have a, a machine where I just eight ounces. You have a pot machine? Yeah. And I'm nice. like, fine. You know, I mean, that for you that you drink the eight ounces, that limits, you know, that gives you the amount. Yeah. And that will give you your one cup and then you're good. But I will say once a month, I intentionally, intentionally go to a Mexican restaurant where they serve cafe de olla. Te lo dan hasta con el, like, the little jarrito, like, the jarrito and everything. And, and it has a lot of sugar, right? But it's piloncillo. Yeah, it is piloncillo. And when I go there, I like going because when I drink it, it reminds me of my abuelita. Like, mm. just like, we went to the ranchito and everything was, like, so cold. And he's like, here's your cafecito. And, and so it reminds me of even the younger version of me where in the summer we went to help my abuela because she had a rancho. And so we were in charge of helping her with, like, la cosecha, los animales, whatever she had, las gallinas. That was my favorite thing, like, go get the gallinas and los huevos and stuff like that. So it reminds me of, like... My abuelita. Those moments. I love that. On my end, I am drinking. So I got an espresso machine recently. And finally, after eight years of doing this podcast, finally have a proper espresso machine. And so I made myself a latte for our conversation today. I love that. I'm already have like almost done drinking it. And it wasn't a pretty latte. It was, it, was, it was a functional latte. And it's, I can only do one latte a day though because espresso is much stronger. Mm -hmm. But then I give myself permission to have a, a cup of drip coffee. And that one, you know, I, I, I still st steam my milk. And yo tomo café con leche. So, si lo tomo, when I drink black coffee, it has to be a pour over, which is when I go to, to coffee shops and they make pour overs that's when I indulge on like a good coffee I like the shots too like the espresso shots just like that with two package of raw sugar <laughs> nice nice and I don't know where I got that because I growing up I didn't really had raw sugar like I just had a sugar right and call it lucky but now it's like I really like it I, I just love how it tastes and so that's what I do um, but so when I go to um, downtown in Seattle for like speaking engagements or things like that, I will stop to get like uh, just like a couple of shots of espresso. And I'm like, okay, I'm good to go, right? Nice. Okay, about the tequila, like get the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> get the coffee. All right, let's get back to the show. Bueno, entonces, you quit your job and your husband is kind of like sustaining, but you get this like guilt of how are you going to contribute? And when do you start exploring your money story? So once I stopped working, I went through a period where I went from managing 52 employees to not having a baby that the only thing she could say, Baba and Mama. And I was <laughs> like, How, what am I going to do with you? Right. So I needed to have my brain really like active. And I start saying like, well, what can I do to contribute to the family, right? Because I, I'm always knew that being a stay at home mom wasn't for me, and I, and I have a lot of love for those mamas that are like, yeah, I, I dream of being a stay at home mom. Like I live for that. Like my goodness, like 
<laughs> like I love that for you, but it's not for me. And so I started looking at, okay, what was I doing at, at work that I can implement now at the house? Nice. One of them was the finances. And so I started to dive into the finances and eventually I was like, okay, now I done all of this school and I have a student loan day. My husband has a student loan debt too. So we got clear on what are we doing? Like, what are we going to do? What is our plan? And I remember my husband saying like, well, you can, you know, maybe think about like, how can we like maximize the money that we have? Not that you have to, but if you want to do something, this is something that you can do. And I realized that I was good at like the numbers, but there was always that mentality of like, well, but it's not my money. Mm. Like, it's really not, I'm not contributing anything. Like I had $2,000 when I left my nine to five. <laughs> now it keeps decreasing. What am I going to do? And I realized that even the thought of like, it is his money make me feel like I wasn't good enough. And I decided, well, there, there is probably something here that needs to be explored that in the past I never cared for. And in the past, I never needed to explore. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting curious, like, I wonder if the way I feel about money had something to do with me just hanging on that dream for eight years when I knew that I was underpaid. So I got super curious and that is something that I'm proud to say, like that is my superpower. Like I'm a very curious person. There are some times when I explore things that obviously make me like, oh my God, that sounds so scary, but I was still leaning to that curiosity and I will say, let's go find out what can we learn from this. And I started diving into my relationship with money, my money mindset, I came across a term that I've never heard before in my life, which was money wounds and financial trauma. And I was like, oh my God, trauma? <laughs> like I'm broken, I'm broken. I'm never going to recover from these. And I was like, hold on. Like if, if you were talking to somebody else, what would you tell the person? So I started giving myself a lot of self-love, self-compassion. And I said, girl, you've been through a lot, but I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to help you become a better version of yourself. I'm going to help you have the most beautiful relationship with money. And guess what? We're going to put our money to work. So I dove into how to create a budget, how to pay off debt. Later on, um, my husband is like, okay, I can see that you're, you know, liking what you're doing with my nena. I was like, girl, we need to get out of the house because this is not okay. You and I cannot just be talking blah, 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 and <laughs> that all day long. So I started taking her to the public library for story time, where um, that was actually my first time hearing somebody else read stories in Espanol at the library, because in the nice. school, where I was from, yeah. yeah, that was not such a thing. So we start going to the library on Wednesdays at 10 p.m. That was like our routine. While I was there, I started grabbing books on personal finance. Like even the lady at the library was like, here for the next one because I was always like yeah let me read more what mm. else do you have and I noticed that those books were not written for me mm. those books had a lot of like well when you inherit that money mm -hmm. here's how you make it work and how you put it to work and how you pass it down to your kids and I was like I got no money like I left my job I do have a 401k that I don't know what that means yet I have a baby, I have medical bills, I just purchased my first home with my husband, like that home that we have, that is the first house that our family owns and we never had a home because again, I move up so much and I said, okay, this makes no sense for me. Mm -hmm. There's a gap on the narrative that I want to hear that people like me need to hear, right? Because that the author that wrote the book didn't experience financial trauma, didn't experience um, being underpaid, didn't experience like ha being raised by a single mom. But I was like, okay, enough about me. What can I learn from these people? So I learned a couple of things there. And then I finally decided to go back to school to earn my MBA because I was bored. Like I always say this, like getting my MBA wasn't like, oh yeah, Latina with masters, who, who, me, right? <laughs> like, I want to be part of the 3%. Like I never had the idea I went there because I was bored, right? Like I want to talk to humans. I want to have interaction with, with adults because my baby can only take so much. 
through the process, Pam, I learned about investing and generational wealth. And that was the first time I heard those words. And I was like, wait, what is this? What does it mean to let your money work for you? What does it mean to invest? What does it mean that you can make work optional? And I just became fascinated with the idea of like, oh my God, does that mean that I don't have to be in survival mode anymore? And I got hooked. Like I went to other libraries, even around like the, the border towns <laughs> in, in like near like Washington, Oregon, where else can I go to their libraries so I can access more books? Because I'm not sure if you know these, but a lot of the local libraries or the state libraries don't allow certain liter literature to cross borders because they don't want people to know. There's actually a book titled The Librarian that I highly recommend for people. It's fascinating. And so I will go find these books. I started to like buy my own books and I just got so passionate about these. And I said, do my people know that stuff? Mm -hmm. And I came across an article online that talked about how financial literacy isn't taught in, in school or high school, particularly in communities of color. On purpose. Intentionally. And I, did, I wasn't okay with that. And... I just decided I'm going to do something. I don't know what that is right now. Like, I honestly had no idea. I didn't know it was going to be say all the wealth. I'll be lying if I say, yeah, I say all the wealth. Mm -hmm. Like, that You were wealth. clear since the beginning. I wasn't. All I knew is that I wanted to help our community. So I started to call the colleges, the high schools, and said, hey, I want to come and talk to your students about budgeting. I want to talk to students about the importance of like caring for their money. And some of those people were like, yeah, absolutely. Come on over. And a lot of people were like, hell no, we don't want you to come and disturb the peace in the school because wow. we, we need workers. Like I literally had one, one college still tell me we don't want our students to know that because we need to prepare them for the workforce. Wow. School to prison pipeline. Yeah, I was like, well, what am I going to do? And I had this idea and it honestly kept me up at night. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to help my people? And then the pandemic hit. Nobody started coming, right? Yeah. And I remember being in front of my, my TV in the living room and the headlines read like, women of color are the first ones to be let go of the workforce. Most of them don't have an emergency fund. Most of them don't have childcare. Yep. And I started to cry. I was really upset. And I, I my husband was with me and I said, that's what I'm going to do. And he said, what? I said, I, I'm going to teach that to women. I'm going to teach that to marginalized like folks. And I'm going to help them understand that we have the right for equitable financial prosperity. And he said, do it. And that's how my business was born. So it wasn't like I did the market research that everyone tells you to do and like make sure there's a need. Like I didn't have any of that at the beginning. Now I do, of course. But that's how my business got created. So with all of this journey, did you ever doubt yourself so because everyone has a money story so you talk about money ones and so <laughs> I often tell people if you want to work on your trauma start a business because that's where all your little buttons will get pushed and everything will come to the surface and so how was it for you to navigate starting a business talking about money when you have your own money wounds yeah so I had the background of the technical aspect of how to run a business. I knew what it takes to organize and strategize a business because I did that for the company that I used to work. I could talk about, I can talk about finances like it's a movie, right? Like I'm, I'm really good at it. I didn't know how to do it online. Yeah. I didn't know how to go on Instagram and talk normal, like as if somebody was in front of me. <laughs> and so one of the things that I I did was I need help. I need to hire someone that can teach me how to do this. And so I hired my first business coach uh, and she was Latina. And I said, 
this person is going to show me how to be online because locally nobody wanted to know to I don't say nobody like the few people that I ask they're like no your business is not for for us because we want we need you to be a bank or a credit union or all of these things no I just want to teach and so I did that and the money, the inner niña wounds, the money wounds, all of the rejection wounds and any other wound that you want to add to the sofita came to me all at once. And I was like, wow, this is one of the hardest things I've done, right? Because now I've, I was facing rejection, crickets, like everyone is like, yeah, buy the website and the right. logo and people are going to come to you. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? Because in my previous job, we had the website and the business cards and the logo. In the crickets, right? And then I was like, nobody loves me. No, nobody wants to do business with me. And through that process, I was like, wow, there's so much work that I need to do for myself. But I was also like my whole life, I've always loved books about psychology and positive mindset, almost like positive, like oh, way too much positive, right? But yeah. no, I never heard like the inner work and inner child, any of that. So that's when I knew I was like, I got to, I got, I need some help. Like my business, my business mission is not an option. Like I want to help my community. And for that, I need to become a better human being. And I need to, like, if I want to teach people to care for their money, to care for their story, to care for their long-term success, I need to do that for myself. And so I went to therapy. I started working with holistic coaches I've, I've never not have a business coach since I started. I only for like six months and I didn't do anything for those six months. Mm-hmm. But I've learned that to be successful in your business, you need to be okay doing uncomfortable things and you need to build the board of directors. And that is having a business coach, having a life coach or a therapist, having someone who can keep you accountable, mm-hmm. your accountant, a bookkeeper, but you need to have those people. And on top of that, you need to prioritize your movement. You need to prioritize your well-being because the website doesn't make you money. You make the money. And so when you are not 100% happy and comfortable with your own skin, no one is going to be comfortable giving you 1,000, 3,000, 10,000. So I did a lot of inner work. Like I have binders (laughs) of like my notes, my mindset, all of the things I did. Because I was like, I, I need to keep track of everything that I'm going through because who knows, maybe in the future it can become a book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Actually, it is because I am writing a book. Nice. Um, and yeah, it exactly right what you're saying. If you want to heal your inner niña or any wounds, launch a business. <laughs> and it's worth it. In that moment, it feels like the world is against you. In that moment, it feels like failure is joking you it feels like you're never gonna see the light but that moment you get that client that says yes to you and here's my money and help me and then you turn around and give them results that changes everything for you yes for sure so from the moment you started the business to where it is now how has it shifted how many iterations are we on because i think Context is important, and many times we see people at the top of the mountain, right? Like, we're like, oh, well, that's great you got there. But this is why I ask these questions, because we often skip. Like, I don't, I'm not a fan of the Rex to Riches story, because I think it lacks so much context, context, and it leaves so many pieces, like, critical pieces of the story out for the sake of showing contrast. Mm -hmm. And I think that contrast is necessary. And and sometimes it's even okay to say, look, I, this is the progress and this is something that I got actually help with. So I think in your case, for example, you were able to quit your job and your husband was there. That's something I think, I think that's important part of the story that, you know, like I see many people skip that part because they're like, oh, I went from like housekeeper to money coach. And then, yeah, but like, Tell me the in-between. So how many times has your business shifted since you started? Because it started with that idea. It started with you noticing, like watching that fact and be like, oh, no, we need to do something about this. And how have you given yourself permission to actually make those changes? Yeah. 
So I've had a little bit of everything. I have had very successful ideas and I have some ideas that came to fruition. And then I was like, what was I thinking? (laughs) So one of the things about me is like, I have resilience like written on every single cell of my body. So even if I have a bad idea or a flop launch, I'm a fighter. I'm going to show up because that's how deeply I believe in what I'm doing. This isn't about me having a a multi six figure business or a seven figure business. Like this is about me truly um, aligning my values with the mission of say all the wealth. And so I have that like resilience is like all over me. And so when I started the business, the moment I decided it is going to be a business, it was never about is going to be the business that is going to make me millions. I started the business thinking it's going to be the business that is going to help break multi-generational money cycles. So that was my why. And my why became so deep, like in my mind that I said, I'm going to keep going even if I fail. And then to answer your question, I have months where I was like, I had months that I was like, my God, I'm making $10,000 a month. That's the most I've made. I had a speaking engagements when people pay me $10,000 and I'm like, me? Okay, here I go. <laughs> and it feels so good. I have had launches for my group coaching, which is the Say Ola Wealth Academy, where I have people ready to buy and they're like, yes, please help me. I want to be part of it. And then I had a couple of flop lunches where I had the strategy, the graphics, the emails and nobody but one of the things that I like talking about with that specific instance is I knew that money avoidance wasn't going to help me overcome any flops or any fails so from the beginning of my business I intentionally set up the investments and my money systems for when a flop happens which will happen in your Mm -hmm. business I could feel financially safe And I work with people that can help me see that the flop launch, it isn't about me, my intelligence of my work. It is that there's something that needs to be adjusted, right? Maybe the timing wasn't right. Maybe the pricing wasn't right. Maybe the the marketing wasn't right, but it's not about me. And so I've been very blessed to work with people that can help me navigate that. And I always come back to like, this is why I'm being so mindful of my money. And when I'm talking about being mindful, I'm not micromanaging my money. I'm not like hardcore budgety. Let me see where every dollar goes. I am not like that. You know, I, I like, I'm lazy. I like mm-hmm. automation. And so I set up my, my business investments to help me be safe. And then after that, I'm like, okay, what can I learn from this? What can I adjust? And a lot of people that launch a business, they don't want to go through the audit of what didn't work mm-hmm. because they haven't done the inner work, right? Like that's why working with people like you is so important because you teach people the importance of like detaching themselves from their business and not everyone is willing to do that. It's hard. It's hard because it's it becomes part of your identity, kind of like how it was your your identity to become that hotel manager and it took so long to release it. It's people get so attached to their business because it's also their baby. It's something they birth. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned that because it really is never personal. If people don't buy from you, it's not because they don't like you. It's not because you did something wrong. It's because the language wasn't right. It's because the button wasn't working. It's because an automation didn't kick off. You know, it's, it's many times external versus internal. And this is where your inner niña comes in and it's like she connects all the familiar things and this rejection that may look like a business rejection. She goes back into the archives and says, yeah. what feels familiar? Let me bring that up. And let me connect Yeah, that. absolutely. And you know, my best launch, like I had a 50K launch for a group and you know what was my strategy? I told my inner niña, we are going to have so much fun this launch, we're going to have, you and I, girl, we're going to dance, we're going to sing, we're going to act, we're going to be spontaneous. So my launch wasn't planned in the sense that I didn't have my real schedule in advance, my emails written in advance. Like I was having fun with my email 
and it showed like my my real views went up. People were liking my content. People were like, "Oh my god, I see you having so much fun!" And people bought for me. Yeah. And I remember when I added it, like, well, what did I do different? I was like, I have fun with my inner niña. So for those of you that want to grow your business, it's like sometimes what if what if the power of that, what's going to make you money is not the strategy, but it's about you having fun with your inner niña. So it blew my mind. I'm like, and I do that now when I'm getting ready to like do content. I'm like, I want to have fun. I don't want to I don't want to write content because it's a task. Yes. And when I have fun, I love it because people see that and and people buy and people are like, I want to work with her. She's so much fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, because we're we're actually our little niñitas, our little child children, because we carry so many. Yeah. They're within us. We just grew into adult bodies and you know, we started like aging but they're still within us they still exist and they still want to have that fun yeah and I celebrated her after the launch I was like what do you want what do you want what can I buy for you and um I've I've been watching this Latina owned brand where I was like I I want to buy this lipstick that celebrates um Valde Beauty that celebrates like the courage and like the, the whole the whole vibe of the lipstick is like mind-blowing to me but I remember being an inner niña and watching my mom put on her red lipstick and I remember just thinking this woman you know my mom I was like this woman is the most powerful woman I've ever seen I want to be like her right because she went through so much like a divorce five kids moving all kinds of stuff and so when I hit the launch that's how I celebrated my inner niña I bought her the lipstick and I went in the in front of my mirror and I put it on and I said, this is for you. And I put it on and I remember the memory coming back of me watching my mom say, like, my, my mom is such a badass. <laughs> I love that. I want to hear about how your marriage has shifted your money story because I heard you talk about it and yes. I think it's fascinating. And tell us, I love the story about the car, <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, tell us more. Yeah. So when I marry my husband, so my husband is a white male. I I always say beautiful. He's like, don't tell people I'm beautiful. I'm like, that's how I see you. I don't care if they see you otherwise. He came from very humble beginnings. So our upbringings are almost like a blueprint of each other. He also moved out a lot growing up. He he experienced divorce like mine did. His dad was around, but not really kind of like my, my dad. His mom worked hard and she believed in the power of working hard every day, right? Like you show up, you are committed. My mom was the same way. My mom had really, really good work ethic. However, his mom taught him about the importance of money. And my mom taught me the importance of working hard. Yes. And so when I met my husband, we we started getting to know each other. And anytime we had had a conversation, he'll say like, oh, I did this. I'm like, me too, right? And it was weird because when he introduced me to his friends, they're like, you two are cut by the same cloth. You two are exactly the same. Like the only difference is she's Mexican and you're a white man. And so I've noticed that about him, that he was very mindful, not frugal, but mindful. For example, I grew up where no se come like comida the next day, right? Like you you just don't because that's fuchi, right? Mm. He grew up being like, you don't waste food. Mm-hmm. Not because we don't have money, but because it takes a lot of time and energy and effort. People to put sweat into this so you don't waste food. And I remember when I married him, I was like, wait a minute, like leftovers? What? Like that's, ooh. And so we started talking about this. Then the other thing that came was the car that you just mentioned. So we wanted to buy a vehicle. And after we had our daughter, he's like, we need to have a bigger car. And I was like, I think I can wait. So I waited. Then we had our second baby. He's like, we really need to buy a car. And I said, great. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to go to a car dealership and get like the latest model and I'm going to have a car. And he's like, let's look around. And I said, what do you mean look around? We can't just go here. He's like, no, we have to like compare prices. We have to check the quality. And he's very mindful like that. And I was like, oh my God, this is so boring. Like, why is he making me do this? But I've learned that's how he is, right? we make purchasing decisions very different. Mm -hmm. We found the car. It was from a private owner. And he's like, great, let's go get 
money from from the bank. And I said, what do you mean? And he's like, I've never had a car payment. And in the moment, I realized that I've always had a car payment. (laughs) And I said, okay. And that moment just completely blew my mind. Like how you don't have to borrow somebody else's money. You can use your own money and still make money. We walked to, we met the owner at a car dealership because that's where we kind of exchanged like the documents and had like a cert- certify and all of that. And I remember giving this person the a money. Check? Ah, no, it wasn't even a check. It was cash. Wow. I've never, and it was, it was like 14,000. I've never hold it that big chunk right. that you see in the movies. But I remember energetically feeling so free not even empowered just free and I remember that person grabbing the money and be like all shaky and I was like what you want it he's like no no I just never seen wow right? and we had received like everything was legal and that moment changed my life and so throughout the years I'm this month is like my ninth year of being married to my husband and just how he is so calm about when he talks about money that has served me well because I'm no longer in this scarcity mindset I'm in this like mindful right there's always more mm-hmm. but if you truly believe that you have to you have to do what your money needs which is put me to work right and so we've learned that so we splurge on things we go on vacation because we value that so we mm-hmm. go on vacation like for sure once a quarter like we take a big vacation on the weekends, we also do like a three-day weekend. And so for that, we need to be mindful of how we spend and how we invest. So we always prioritize investing. And the beautiful part is that I get to do that part, right? Because that, that, <laughs> that's the of genius now. So we're always thinking about how can we take care of our future selves, but also how can we thank ourselves for the hard work, for the mm-hmm. commitment, for the dedication. And we do that. And we also love helping people. And so how can we also use your money to create a resource for other people, right? And I'm not saying that we give like millions of dollars a year because we don't have millions of dollars a year. But even if it's like a couple hundred, we're like, we're happy to help someone because it's going to come back like tenfold. Yeah, money loves to be circulated. I love that story because... And we could literally, I can dissect it in so many ways, but we're running out of time, sadly. (laughs) But I'm so curious. Like, I have so many questions about that story because it's fascinating. You want to know something too, Pam, in regards to like how, so we we know this, we are a byproduct of our environment. So if you live in scarcity, you're going to grow scarcity. If you change your environment and you start hanging out with people that have a whole different perspective about money, you're going to become that. 100%. 100%. I have two girls. Those girls, when we talk about money, their whole behavior and their whole mindset about money is so different than even my husband's and I. And he, he, we have good mindset now, both of us. He've always had a good mindset. But my girls, they don't know what a scarcity is. They don't, they, all they know is abundance and all I know, all they know is how to be responsible with their money. Mm-hmm. And all they know that when they spend money, they have to spend money on things that is going to help them grow. So I take them to the uh, bookstore. They love buying books, right? And then they also have money that they, they love to give to the church or they love to the pay rescue or whatever. And I'm talking about five bucks, three yeah. bucks in there. But they love doing that. And there's a story about um, a member of our church who had an unforeseen illness. And we were talking about this, my husband and I in the kitchen. And then my eldest heard about it. And she goes, I want to help him. And I said, how would you like to help him? He's like, we'll be right back. So she went to her room and wrote a letter to him and then put $2 in an envelope. And when we went to church... She gave him the envelope and at this point we were not, we didn't know what it was. We thought it was just a letter or something. He's like, I want to help you with, because I know that you're not working right now. And this man is like in tears at church. And so we, so are we, because we're like, wow. And so I'm sharing this with you guys because 
it, I always say this, it only takes one person to change the trajectory of future generations. And for me, seeing these girls that they just have such a good relationship with wealth. And they know that because at home, we don't use the word rich at all. We use the word wealthy, right? Because wealthy is not just the money, but wealth is also feeling like there is enough and also feeling that your body has to be prioritized. Movement needs to prioritize your your health, your nutrition, your mindfulness. And so I see these girls and their relationship with money is so healthy. I'm like, oh, yeah. what are they going to do in the world? <laughs> I love that. Oh, so fun. Yeah, the energetics of money are fascinating. And I agree. Money likes loves to be circulated. That's it's a, it's a river. And and I think, unfortunately, in our community still, there is that fear of not enough. Eso precisamente, when you said, you know, my mom taught me how to work hard. His mom taught him how to manage money. So what would be the first, like, one step that people could do to shift that perspective of working is the only thing that brings me money? Because I have this conversation often with people. and I often tell them you have to redefine work yes that's the first step because we learned that working hard is what gets you to whatever the American dream so what do you say to that I will say find the evidence because we we can't believe what we can see right like there's people that believe in ghosts because they're 100 sure that they've seen a ghost right so if you want to believe that your money can work for you, you have to find the evidence. And the first step or the safest way is for you to open a high yield savings and deposit $50. Come back after six months and see how the $50 now is probably 60 or 55 and that $5 or $10 you may passively, which means you didn't do anything. And that, that for me was the biggest mindset shift too, because I said, if I don't have the evidence that my money can work for me, how, I'm, how, how am I going to believe that it's possible? Is it going to feel uncomfortable at first? Absolutely. Because no one in our family has done it before. Can you become accustomed to earn money without working hard? You bet. Because the funniest thing I've ever heard is people saying, well, I don't want to invest because I don't want to become lazy. Wow. I said, that is a very funny thought. Let's go ahead and explore that. And no one becomes lazy when they invest. You actually become more productive because you focus more on you. Mm -hmm. You have what I call optionality, right? The optionality of, I want to work four days a week. I want to work three and a half days a week. I work four days a week. My husband works three and a half days a week optionality of, hey, I'm going through a hard time in my relationship or even my mental health, I'm going to take a sabbatical and my money still works for me. So yes, invest. Is it going to feel uncomfortable? Absolutely. But find that evidence and don't wait until you have thousands of dollars because in our community, we celebrate that milestone of like sacrifice. Me voy a sacrificar until I have my guardadito and then I'm going to put it to work. It's like, no. Start with 50. Commitment. Automate. Because I'm lazy. I'm like, I don't want to be transferring my money every month. Like, automate. We now have the necessity to use a phone, right? No one in our community goes without having a phone, right? Mm -hmm. What if you treat your investments the same way or your savings? You don't even have to start investing. And then once you have the evidence, get curious and say, what if, what if, what if rather than giving me 20 a month, it gives me 200? <gasps> What do I need to do to get 2000 right? Like I, I have this reel on Instagram where I talk about how my life changed by 10000 The first time I saved 10000 because I never had 10000 The second was the first time somebody paid me 10000 The third is the time my investments pay me 10000 mm. And I was like, oh, right? And then the other one was the moment somebody said, we want you to be a keynote and we're going to pay you 10000 and I was like, right? Yes. Now, maybe for the listener, it's, it's 100. It doesn't have to be 10,000. You get there. But it's so important that we truly understand the concept that investing is truly revolutionary. And there's people that don't invest because they're like, 
well, I don't want to be part of like this capitalist society because they take from the people, they take from my people. And to that listener, I said, research conscious capitalism. Mm -hmm. It would change your mind. <laughs> I love that. Lucy, tell us all the places and spaces where people can find you. Absolutely. So people can find me on Instagram, also on my website, say hola wealth. I'm writing a book that is coming out until 2026 and it's titled Cash Libre, but you don't have to wait for the book. You can also join my Cash Libre newsletter on my website. And I'm here to, I'm here for you. Like you listening to the podcast, like I want to help you. So you don't have to like invest in me to get resources from me. If you literally email me and say, this is my question. I always like creating a podcast for the listeners because that's, that's how deeply I believe in the power of investing. I love that. Well, thank you so much for all your work. Last few questions. Do you have a remedio you want to share with us? Yes. <laughs> and it's not any tea or vaporu. <laughs> my remedio when I don't feel good is get close to nature. Mm. In our community, when we're sick, it's always like, enciérrate, acuéstate get the blankets is like, no, get outside, get close to nature because that will help you feel 100% better. Agreed. That's my remedio. <laughs> I love that. And I agree 100%. Do you have a quote or mantra that you live by right now in this chapter of your life? Yes. And this is for our community too, is that we need to let go of the belief that debt is good or bad. Debt has no moral value. We need to learn how to leverage it. Yes. Oh, I agree. So much. Um, and the last question, two more. What's your productivity tip, trick, or tool? I prioritize me. So if I don't move my body, I'm not allowed to work. So I, I will go on walks or pongo canciones. I like bachata and salsa and that kind of stuff. And so I will put a song and, and move my body. And after that, I'm like, I'm productive. I'm ready to do whatever I need to. And it makes such a difference. It literally moves so much energy. I agree 100%. I work out in the mornings. Do you too? Yes. Yeah. I can't do evenings. So the first thing I do is I move my body in the morning. Yeah. And then I start work. I agree. Get out of the house. <laughs> totally. Y la última pregunta, how are you taking a restorative pause today? Ooh, I love this. So... After your podcast, I'm going to go move my body. And then after that, I actually schedule therapy. Yay. I love that. That's a great pause. Yes. I, I, I love I love investing in things that will make me be a better human being. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's it's so worth it. It's, it's, yo pienso que vale, un, vale más que comprarte una bolsa, you know, or like yes. shoes. Yes. And you know, funny thing you say that because I recently, <laughs> I've been needing a purse for a while, but I, I was having a conversation about, do I want the purse because I need it or because somebody, because, or because I saw somebody else with a fancy purse. Mm. And so I always like to evaluate like the way I purchase things now. And it's not that I don't have the money, um, but I'm, I'm mindful. And I was like, no, I actually need the purse because I look at my purse and I'm like, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. Time. <laughs> And you can do both, right? Like invest in therapy, invest in coaches, especially holistic coaches. Like I'm a big fan of, 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 of you guys, business coaches. Um, but yeah, buy, buy the purse too. Like that, that's like your second theme. Totally. Yeah. Because it feels good to también, you know? Claro. Bueno, thank you so much for being here and for your work. Listeners, definitely check out Lucy. And thank you. Thank you for having me. I love your podcast, the work that you do. And I also want to say thank you for bringing diver Diverse Voices to your podcast because having a podcast is a lot of work and you are very few of the people that do heck of a job. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Bueno, listeners, that was my conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There's so many stories, I think. There's so many things, so many topics we can explore and so many layers that lead us to, to our own, to exploration of self-worth. This is why I started, I launched 
It's kind of funny because she started her business in 2019 and I launch the 30 day tapping challenge in 2019, I believe. Maybe 2020, maybe, maybe it was in 2020. Because I was talking to a lot of people, a lot of my clients were dealing with this money story. What I realized is that ultimately, your money story is connected to your worth. And one of Calladita culture's wounds, actually, they're changing. So I think this is why there was some apprehension on me on releasing Cayeta Culture principles, but now they've shifted and I had an epiphany that Cayadita Culture as the villain in her story, we have the Cayeta Culture wounds and there's five wounds. And within those, there's a money story one. And it's not necessarily the money story that's part of Cayeta Culture, but your money story is weaved into the Cayeta Culture wounds. And so, this conversation was very timely and I wanted to just talk about all the things with Lucy because she is just great to talk to. But I want to, I hope you resonate with some of the content. Please do tag us and let us know what's up. So if you're here at the end, I have tools now <laughs> and we're going to do something. So when I share on Instagram specifically, when I share this episode, type the word in a comment, money. And because I have tools, I'm going to program this. So when you type the word money, I'm going to give you a discount to my 30 day tapping challenge. And it's going to be a generous discount because we're turning eight and who knows, maybe it's 88% off. But make sure you say the word money in one of the comments in whichever we share a couple of posts about this episode. So whenever you catch it, type the word money, you're going to get a message from me that will give you that code so you can get access to the 30-day time challenge and start working on your money stories. And hundreds of people have gone through this challenge, so it works. And if you're interested in tapping, this is a good introduction because you tap for 30 days. El punto es que if this is something that you resonate it with, please tag us on socials. At Café Con Pan Podcast on all the socials. Tag Lucy, of, of course, and let us know what it is that resonated with you, with you the most. If this is your first time, welcome. Please do leave a rating, a review, a star, whatever works for you. That is a great and easy way to support the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, this is a great time to subscribe, to like, to leave a comment, to share this video with someone you think will resonate with. We have now the um, listener questions form. So it's on my website. You can also send me a DM and literally just type, hey, I have a listener question and my tools. <laughs> so I'm going to program it so that you get a response that gives you the link. So all you have to do is send a DM, listener questions, and I'll send you the form. It's anonymous. Also, if you don't want me to know that it's you, you can also go to my link in bio and or gafacompam.com. The form is there on their contact us and you can ask whatever it is you want. I'm already receiving questions from you. So we're saving them so until we have enough to do a full episode, which very likely will be at the end of this month. And so please keep it up. I'm loving seeing your questions. They're amazing. And they're questions that I didn't know you were wondering and you were interested in me answering this, which is amazing. So listener question, send me a DM, I'll send you the link, or go to kafakumpam.com, contact us. The listener question form is going to be there, completely anonymous, and you can access it very relatively easy. Y bueno, listeners, thank you so, so much, so, so much for being here today. Como siempre, stay shining. Sabrosura, pa ti que, que.